Can you hear that wolf? Can you hear the winds rustling through the trees and the leaves? Do you hear the birds? Do you hear the ocean? The ocean was roaring last night. That was trippy. Awesome night last night. Just incredible. There was this one song that when I was staying in Australia with a friend of mine, it was just randomly in the middle of this song, it would say, jungle living is the best. (laughs) Jungle living is the best. That was it. It was was just just like one lyric in the song. It was just like programming you. (laughs) It was like, you know what? Jungle living is the best. Yeah, that's that's a good subliminal message as opposed to like, eat chips ahoy. (laughs) (laughs) So... We're sitting here on the lanai in the middle of a jungle ecosystem on the edge of the largest water mass in this known reality, the great mother Pacific Ocean. And we're humbly reflecting on just how, how awesome it is to be connected on a spiritual level and on a grounded physical level to such immense beauty. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely agree. I feel super blessed being connected to this immense beauty that we call Hawaii. Yeah. Absolutely elated that the connections here on these islands, and especially the connection to the Aina of this island, and the magic of the mana that exudes from every rock, every leaf, every tree, every living thing on these islands is exuding life force energy. It's like you're in a different dimension, like the lightning the other night. That's right. It's like a dip from a different dimension. It's like that must have been how it was in Atlantean times or be- before that. There, things were sharper, crisper, cleaner, something less, like less that. Less interference. Less interference. Right. It's just like the more fresher, younger earth. That's right. And so mana, let's talk about mana. You know, it's our brother Paul Check names his, his son mana. Right. It's a great name. Great name. Mana is identified as an etheric force that represents itself outwardly and inwardly through all the living elements of the islands, right? We have such a reductionist system of thinking about things. Oh, we're going to reduce things to atoms or we're going to reduce things to these compounds or these molecules. Those are just tools and parameters of understanding. They aren't the absolute truth of everything. But if they were, then there wouldn't be exceptions to every rule and law. There's always exceptions because nothing's ever accurately totally explained mana is this force that that just lights up every atom every compound every chlorophyll molecule it gives an extra sparkle it twilights everything it's the extra glow you get from the heavens it's the extra glow you get from the moon here i mean i was i came up here one time we were having a fire in the front yard i came up here one time and i walk on the lanai right here and i look out and the moon was out and the moon was casting a perfect moon bow, not a circle around the moon. It was a full moon that was casting a rainbow that was in silvers, grays, blacks, and whites. Wow, interesting. That was coming directly at you? Yeah, it was basically like a, like a, the moon was, say, over there, and it was there was clouds over there, and it was producing a rainbow right there, like a real rainbow, but cast by the moon. Interesting. Which has probably has a completely different frequency than any of anything else it's a phenomenon what, did, it's what a, were you feeling it I was i was felt insanely blessed that i had seen this phenomenon again not a moon bow that surrounds the moon sitting up there right but a rainbow cast by the moon that's in all silvers grays blacks and whites it was something i was i was just taken aback it was it was maybe something you see once in your life it's that kind of thing more commonly in hawaii because it's the rainbow state a lot yeah. of rainbows here yeah, you know, that's the thing with being out here and feeling the aina and feeling the mana of the land is that it opens up portals of thought and emotion and frequency and energy that you're able to access and see it more clearly. And then it creates momentum with you on how you approach everything in your life. So it's reciprocated, right? You take it in. There is an energetic value to seeing something like that. Like that visual majesty came into your lens entered your brain, entered your body, and now it's a toroidal energy that's circling around you. Right. Right? Yep. That's, that's what vision does. And then when you smell a fresh soursop or a, a, a coconut or a papaya or relenia or whatever, that does something to you or a cacao, all these things. And then when you touch them and feel the earth and you feel your, you know, you're, you're protecting, you know, other plants from other plants and you're clearing the way 
That's another energy, right? That's the biodynamic principle, right? Steiner's whole perspective on biodynamics. Again, I've say, I feel like I say this ad nauseum. It wasn't so much to make the most beautiful, elegant, mineralized, healthy food. It was to develop the inner consciousness of men and women and children and develop that stewardship energy, right? That's really the principle. And the side effect of that was you're gonna have healthy soil. And the side effect of that, you're gonna have healthy food. Yes. And the side effect of healthy food is you're gonna have a healthy population. And when you have a healthy population, then you can get shit done. Then you can become innovative. Then you can have the best life ever. What a concept, what right? A concept. And when you look out there, by the way, that's another thing that we're all gaining from it all is not just the food and the growing of it and the ex exercise of being out there and planting and things like that, but the beauty that we behold of it all is really another incredible side effect. This is why we've got to get people out in the soil, out gardening. You don't have to be an expert. People think, I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know how to do vegetables. Neither do I. I mean, I just, it's chaos gardening. Just throw the seeds out there and pretend like you know what you're doing. That's what I've always done. Now, I'm more of a tree person. For, with trees, I, I can get organized. So I'm not the guy who is going to grow the carrots or the beets or the lettuce, although I've done those things. I've done them well. It's You're a it, tree grower. I'm a tree That's grower. That's just what you That's are. What, yeah, and you but, realize that through trial and error, right? Right. Getting yourself out there is how you're going to figure that out. You, you created something called the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation, right? Yes. And your mission is to what? Grow Is to plant 10 billion trees? 18 what? billion fruit, nut, and medicinal trees. Okay, so this is a good story. You and I and a few other awesome, awesome souls went down to have a soup pie I think this was about five years ago. Can you believe it's been five years? Longer. No, no. it was 2016 when we went. It's six it's been, years. It's coming up on seven years yeah. next year. Wow. Yeah. It feels like it was yesterday almost, but it also does feel like it was a long time ago too. I remember we were cruising down in there. We, you know, we did the uh, eight mile, seven mile descent hike. And as you start getting into the actual Supai region down in the crack, and the, the vegetation starts, right? Because you have the, the, you know, the water lines up there, right? And so we start walking down. All of a sudden, we're coming across these massive pomegranate trees and massive fig trees. It was a sight to behold. I was gorging on them. It was incredible. And they were fruiting. Everything was fruiting and just going off. And I and you looked at me and you're like, you know how those got there? And I'm like, no. And you're like, we planted that probably 20, 12 years ago or some, something like that. Do you remember that? Yes. Yes, exactly. Tell me about that. Well, we've done numerous plantings there. Years ago, when I first went to have a soup pie 25 years ago, we all our food got eaten by horses <laughs> so we had to forage off the wild food that was there and there's quite a bit of wild food there so i noticed that there was quite a bit of wild figs and pomegranates and pretty much we lived off wild figs pomegranates grapes goji berries and per apples persian food persian food a lot yeah. of persian food yeah there was an apple on the side of this native guy's house and we were like look at that apple that apple's like the size of our head that feed all of us <laughs> and there's a one day we we're like let's get it so we just went and we got it <laughs> and uh and so we you know because we were we we're in that mode like we didn't we, we didn't have any food so you just have to forge what that's out there that's really brings a lot out of you it's a really cool thing but our fruit tree planting foundation has done numerous plantings there because of that experience of being down there early on we're like the friend of mine's like you know we should come down here and just plant this place with fruit trees and sure enough years later we did do that how'd you pull that off we helicoptered them in <laughs> and then we got our crew to hike in that's just incredible. that's how it all got there so all, all the big groupings of trees i think they came in by the hundreds maybe a hundred in a in a bundle maybe 200 then we dropped in a couple thousand trees into there that's incredible and so how, how are they thriving in that climate down there because they're, it, it's 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 almost its own ecology down there right down in the pit as right. opposed to out in the more of the desert area that's exposed to the sun right yeah right that, and that's just like the difference between people who live in a valley and people who live on the mountains and you know some people are down you know they don't get to see the sunset over the ocean right right because they're in a valley somewhere that's right and so in there you're you're in the grand canyon you're inside you're of tucked it. in you're tucked in and the water table's a little bit higher there but it comes up Right. That's why you can you have, plant food there. Right. Exactly. You have seven layers of the earth crushed that's crushed to a dust. Yep. And then you've got the springs. There's two springs that come up before Havasupai up higher and they come through the town. That's where the native town is. And then there's the native village and then there's the campgrounds. As you know, we stayed with the native people there because of our you know relationship with them. Right. But the the idea was if we can just get the trees in the ground, the water table's high enough that they'll they'll make it. Yeah. You know, and that, that as we saw with the wild figs and the wild pomegranates, 
And many of them, many thousand of them probably did make it out of maybe 2,000 that we planted down there. I, I'll get the exact numbers, actually. I'm going to see Jim. He's the director of our foundation. He'll, he'll remember the exact numbers, and we'll find out. But that we've always done it that way. We always plant more than we think is going to make it, and we always plant in places where what we're planting will make it, even if nobody takes care of it. Yeah. What's driving you for this? I, I could think of a million things because I know you and I and I I embody some of those. But like, what, where is this drive coming from? Well, it's a, it's a Johnny Appleseed vibe. I'm yep. Johnny Appleseed. I plant trees everywhere I go. I I change ecosystems everywhere I go. In Texas right now, I'm, I'm sprouting up easily over a hundred Maclura pomiferas, which are Osage oranges or hedge apples. They're incredible tree. They're an incredible plant. Incredible. Um, they're fruit. a protector, right? They're a protector. Yeah. And, and you know you, that's your bow and arrow. You know plant that the Comanches, you know, used for their bows and arrows. You, and, you like trees that are versatile. Yeah. That give you interesting. That, that are interesting, that are medicinal, that have many uses to it, that have a story to it, right? Yes. And so to me, woods and trees like this wood right here, like, why do I have this wood right here behind me? Because I'm studying it. And that's from that tree right there, that that Yopo tree right there. I'm studying this hardwood right here and I'm, I'm realizing things about it because I'm also aware that the great trees of the world and these great things out here have properties that have not necessarily been brought to human awareness. Right. We've just been focused on one aspect of it. Like something just the that's, fruit. That's in the fruit. Yeah. Exactly. That's something that might be in embedded in the seeds or things like that. But there's so much more to it. And also in different life cycles of that tree as well. Yes. They present differently, right? Right. Well said. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. So this is one of the great reasons why we like getting people back to farming and growing things. So one of the, one of the, um, I'm trying to think of the name of this plant. It's called Woad. 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 It's it's a it's a it's a European magical plant. And one day I got seeds and I was like, let's grow it. Let's see what happens. This thing's supposed to be magical. OK, well, let's find out. So we're growing it. And it was the most amazing thing over the every two weeks. It completely changes its appearance. Where were you growing this? This is in Canada. OK, cool. So we're growing it. And it was like so eventually after about seven changes of its appearance, I was like, oh, that's it's it's a transformer. Oh, interesting. And it's in, it, as it turned out, it's in the brassica family. So okay. it's, it's related to mustards. It's related to broccoli and cauliflower and those things. And it is. Does it release sulforaphane? Is there sulforaphane? Oh, sure. It's an edible, it's an edible like cruciform. Like, okay. Like the flour that comes yeah. off of it? Oh, sure. You, I okay. mean, you can eat it, but it's not about being eating it. Sure. It's kind of like the, the Osage orange yeah. or the Maclura pomifera. It's not, a, it's not a thing you eat. It's used for different reasons. The fruit has a different energy. Like I bring those fruits in or around me. I have them all around my desk, for example. I'm talking about Osage Orange. Um, just I have 100 in the house. Interesting. You know, just because the vibration, it's a, like a good luck charm or something. So something that I've noticed about you is that you are connected to your inner child. You know, every time I hang out with you, every time I even think about you, I drop into that like child energy and child energy is probably the best compliment I can give someone. Steiner's whole thing is that the moment man or woman starts to lose their inner child, they begin to solidify, they begin to decay and they start to lose the malleability. They become rigid, right? Aramonic by nature, right? And so this is a this is a, a, a the, probably the biggest compliment I can give someone is that you bring out my inner child. And I'm always in the folds of life's mystery and discovery and experiences. We don't just sit around and and bullshit about the latest trend. We sit around and talk about things that are expanding our consciousness, are things that we want to have major breakthroughs with and things that we want to learn. That's, you know, sometimes in the fringe of things. And it's like, oh, well, let's get into there. And it's it's exciting. It's like a it's like a Harry Potter novel 24 seven with you. What 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 is this? How, how do you how, how did you capture this energy? Right on. Thank you for that. Those yeah. are really, I, I think, very deep compliments, and I appreciate that. And I think you characterize me well in that I have a deep reverence for nature, and I'm also intimately aware that very obvious things can be missed by humankind, and therefore I'm always looking for the hyper-obvious, the super sensible, what's right in my face that I'm not seeing, but I'm not finding those things on a computer screen those things are out in nature yeah and that what i love about our computer screens is that we can go find certain pieces of information out fast that help us to comprehend or access or utilize some insight that we're getting from nature quickly so we can merge those two right and have better determinism together. yeah exactly right and so i'm always bringing things back to the natural world because that's what's real like these plants and trees are real you asked me about my fruit tree planting foundation and why we planted 18 
18 billion or why our plan is to plant 18 billion fruit trees. We have planted over a million trees in the world. And the reason is, is because it's permanent. Yeah. They can't remove it. They can't stop me. We're overgrowing the government. <laughs> I love that. Right? It's Instead just, of overthrowing, we're overgrowing. We're overgrowing them. Yeah. And that's part of your vision of paradise. You know, you have a video that you did 15 years back. And what is, what is it? The, the, the core of it is we need to get off this system where we're relying on an outside agency and we have to become agrarian and live off the land and be able to be self-contained and be able to be into the mysteries and beauties of life. And it starts with your garden. It starts with your garden. I mean, if you look out here, all these patterns are patterns that we've selected. So the pattern of a mangosteen, this pattern of an egg fruit over there, the pattern of these cacaos and the different types of cacaos that are in here, the pattern of this yopo tree right here, the pattern of the night blooming jasmine that's growing below it. And all these, these are all patterns that are in fitting in with each other. It's one way to appreciate it, but more deeply like soursop, the, the soursop, like the power yeah, yeah. of the graviola. But, yeah. You know, when I look at that mangosteen right there, that mangosteen is probably, you know, 13, 14 years old. And that tree, like you'd think, oh, I could just go like those branches aren't that thick. They're like that. Yeah. You think I can just go break that. There's no chance you could break that. Yep. Yeah. And it, it's like, what do you, you mean? It's that dense. It's like, yeah, it's that those thin branches. We could climb on that. Yeah. That's how tough that is. <laughs> and by the time that thing's 25 years old, it's one of the best climbing trees in the world. A, a mangosteen also produces a great fruit. That's so, probably about three, four years away from going off, right? Yeah. The, and so I'll put this out here. My favorite fruit outside of a soursop is definitely the mangosteen. Mangosteen oh. for me is a delicacy. It's almost like some kind of exquisite experience, right? Rad. Just the, the way the fruit is, like the, the way you peel it open and all that, the flavor, the texture, the whole thing. How there's like the little pods in there, the little jelly. Sometimes there's more seeds than not. It's a phenomenal fruit. And you talk about climbing that tree. Let's talk about experience I had here. So I was on, I was going berserk this a few years back with Yoga Cello, And we were, uh, I, I was just on a frenzy for lychee, for lychee. And I and I end up climbing the and, and lychee is an incredible fruit. It's it's one of those things that when I think of sun and the ocean spray, oh, lychee comes up for me. They're addicting. They're amazing. They're addicting. It's 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 everyone. It's got to try it. <laughs> okay, and, and you want to get addicted to these. They're super good for you. They're loaded with so many minerals, so many enzymes, so many nutrients. But I don't recommend climbing one <laughs> so i i climbed one i made it at least 25 30 feet up and the and the the tree is just not built to hold a 200 pound man and at some point as i'm getting higher and higher up we heard a crack and i just held on for dear life and dropped right through that whole thing about 25 feet and holding onto the branches is what broke my fall. But I had a, I had a very serious respect for nature at that moment. That was, that was a trip. That happened right there. That was amazing. Not 200, you, you were lucky. You were basically unhurt falling. I mean, you came out with the tree. I mean, the branch broke and the whole section of the tree came, every, off. came off and you came out with it. And and <laughs> you know what? I think when I showed up on the scene, you were emerging from the from the debris. You, you guys heard it from all the way up here. Yeah, we heard it from there. It was like, oh, crack. shit. Yeah, crack. <laughs> that was that was an incredible experience. That was incredible. I actually I actually love that moment, right? I don't know. I'm crazy. Maybe I'm crazy. What else is it about the the let's talk about a little bit about Steiner and his whole thing and the way biodynamics is perceived. It biodynamics is our relationship, understanding all the nuances and, and of the, growing. And energetic forces and concentrates in nature. So etheric, essentially etheric forces. Etheric forces. So this also, is the opposite of monocropping. Literally the antithesis of monocropping. It's also the opposite of scientism. Yeah, that's right. It see, I'm I'm not oversmarting nature. I'm not into scientism, and I don't take on the precepts of scientism that everything can be specifically known, and that there are uh, numerical constants in nature. For example, it's been known for a long time that the speed of light is not a constant; it changes. Yep. But we call it a constant. That's scientism. It just truncates stuff and just said, no, it's this. And and everyone's going to just buy this. It's it, yeah. that's not what's real. So w in nature, you're dealing with real forces. And that's why biodynamics is so amazing. For example, I was over here with Jazzy one day on the stair over here and we were mixing up a biodynamic prep 500. That's the one with the, with the manure and the, the horns. And yeah, and th there's a gal on, on Molokai who ships it over to us, the stuff she preps over there because we don't have cows here yeah and horns right and so she ships it over to us and so we were prepping it up with our spring Let, let's water tell people what that is so you basically put the, the the gold of the middle of the farm in biodynamics is the revered cow manure mm -hmm. that manure is then loaded into a bullhorn 
and it's usually planted right before right after fall like in the middle of fall it's usually september october and it sits in the ground six months and then when springtime comes out you take it out and that manure is basically turns into you know shilajit it turns into humic acid fulvic minerals black gold and then you take that and other forces and other etheric forces right because it's resonating from the ground Uh from the earth yep it hits that formative energy formative energy then you take that up and then you 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 disperse it into a bucket yep and then what you you spray it everywhere so what we did is we actually we had it in a nice big tub and it's really nice i have never made biodynamics in a tub that big before and it's a tub we've had here for years and so now we've got that system really worked out like let's use the biggest tubs we got so we're now we're doing that so when you get it going one way you really can see the spin so you're vortexing it you're vortexing it then you change direction and you do that so you you basically add the spring water to the to the biodynamic prep which is this is prep 500 which is the the cow manure in the horn and then you spray when the full moon opposes saturn Interesting. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the full moon opposing Saturn and why that would be the best time to lay that on the land. Okay. So the moon above, so the moon directly over our head is pulling all the fluids up into the tree, into the plant. Implosionary energy. It's a suction. It's implosion. It's that. Yep. The Saturn down below is pulling and developing all the roots because Saturn and the Saturnian energy is very roots energy. That's right. Right. It's it's like setting up structure. That's right. Very specifically, what is happening is that under that circumstance, it usually happens here. It happens in March and May. There's the day when when the moon's full moon is opposing Saturn. What happens is, is that then the, the, the roots can develop structure and form. And doing this whole region, we did the whole farm with that per- particular prep that we made that day. We sprayed it right before nightfall. I could feel it, you know, when when the moon, full moon was over and we saw Saturn setting, you know, earlier, and you know, because it was like they were opposites of each other. They're they're in they're op they're in opposition actually. Sure. So they're so when the moon was rising, Saturn was setting. Interesting. And so you know, you'd get this thing like this, so that it's like at this point, the moon's overhead, so Saturn would be right below if you know if the heavens are really of a rotund nature okay all right okay that's a whole nother discussion that's a whole nother discussion okay but 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 regardless saturn is down at the horizon right it's down at the lowest point it's below the horizon at that point okay yeah because it's the opposite where the moon is so if the moon's directly above you then it would be directly below you and that would be in the root zone gotcha so so you have these two forces Uh that are colliding Uh uh-huh and then you put that you put those biodynamic preps into the earth Mm -hmm. right and you have like you know what what's theoreticized is that you have a massive containment of that energy through the, the through the preparation yes right it locks it in. It locks it in. And, then, and so it's a fertility energy, by the way, right? When you're right. working with roots and you're trying to you know, d- develop structure, ultimately it's going to lead to fruits. Yeah. This is uh, you know, hard for some people to register. It, right? r- because that, then now this is important why we're doing the show and I think why we'll repeatedly do these messages is because we're so brainwashed by the presuppositions of scientism. Yep. It's what our entire educational system has taught us. It's what's taught us on TV. It's what when we say like, well, this scientist said the whole idea that a scientist is actually some kind of a priest now. Yep. That's scientism. Yep. It, so, you, you know, who knows what that scientist, real scientific method methodology really is or their agenda or their or, agenda or who's backing it up. Oh, yeah. Right. And so the whole thing about science is that you're supposed to be able to explore it and break it apart and apply the scientific method. And it's supposed to work and it's supposed to work and you're supposed to get close to what you assume might happen and you keep trying, you keep trying, but it's never something that should never be questioned. Right. That's that's the Catholic Church. You it's that (laughs) scientism. And that's see, this is something I say to people and they they freak out sometimes. But sometimes people really get it. And that is the 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 whole like the religious fanaticism of a thousand years ago. Like people were religious fanatics back then. That never changed. Right. It's still here right now. It's now it's just in the form of science. It's the form of scientism. Yeah. Because scientism also says you can study this, but you can't study that. That's a big displacement of truth right there. Huge. Yeah. It's uh, it's illusionary. Right? It's illusionary. It's illusionary. It's uh, and it's only giving you one side of things. And we're seeing that happen with our, our systems in our world, our medical system, 
our education system, our financial system. It's sleight of hand, right? And we're get, and people are suffering because of that. Yes. And they're also taken down through, a, you know, a kind of tough rabbit hole and they're left like with nothing to show for it. So it's like, what the hell is going on here? You know, it's a veneer, right? So they yeah. put up some veneer. Oh, this is science. And don't look behind what's happening behind that door. This is accounting. Don't look behind what's happening here. You know, here's our accounting budget for the Pentagon. Don't look at the three point one trillion dollars that went missing or whatever it is. It's just so silly. And so in it, it, now we're at a point of transparency. Now we're at a point where it's like blockchain time where we can see everybody can see it publicly. And, and all of a sudden the governments are running yeah. to hide everything. It's like we can, you know, you can't see this. We don't look over here. It's It's that kind of thing. And that to me, this is all part of this thing of the apocalypse, the which is the yuga that we're in this yeah. time of, of come. We're coming into a better age. But in that to get there, we're a long way to go. Of course, the very first step is we got to see what it all is. And it's like, oh, my God, look at all this corruption and evil. that's going on. These people have been cheating and, you know, all that stuff. But in this world, there's no lie. That's right. You cannot fake it. For, you know, you can't you know create some accurate measurement because it's all chaos oh, yeah in the most beautiful way in the most beautiful way it's a controlled right. chaos it's controlled chaos and so we, it's perfect in the yeah in the development of plants and trees the development of animals the development of animals that you're feeding with the things you're growing the development of wild foods and wild mushrooms and that interaction the, the power of a wild forest and what it's bringing to the table those are things that you behold those are things that you can only really approach by doing it and feeling it and gradually unlearning all the scientism and presuppositions and opening up to the mystery. Let me give you an example that's coming to my mind. I have nanny berries growing in, in Ontario, Canada. That yep. It's you know a really cool stand of them that we planted three originally. Now there's about seven or 10 of them there, but there's about seven of them that are actually producing fruit now, which is so cool. And one of the things that, that happens because we're next to a wild forest, we have like 20 pollinators hit those flowers. Wow. So I can look in the umbral of the flowers when it's when that time of the season's happening in the spring and there will be 20 different types of insects in those flowers within a minute wow sometimes there's five or six or seven all in there at once together yeah that's incredible i mean that tells you something it tells us something yeah that's right. so cool and that's yeah. see that's the power and of the intact forest right see i know that now less so disturbance less dealing with something that's causing so there's more variety of insects chaos. and more variety of pollinators that's right so this is a, a good segue. I want to and and this uh, and I, first of all, I appreciate all of this. This is really sound information. It's good to have this soundboard and go back and forth because this is giving people kind of some clarity on the mysteries of biodynamics before getting into the technical aspects. Uh -huh, yeah. So this was an awesome back and forth on just understanding that some things are outside of just the left brain analytical approach to farming and growing food. We have to be present to the mystery. And that's why Humans are good at being incubators and being stewards. You're stewarding this right now. You don't own this. This isn't yours. You're a steward. You hold that energy. And that's an energy that we all must take in for us to have the best life ever and to feel one with the land and one with our hearts. And feel one with the future, too. That comes up a lot for me. Like, I really think that, like, this land is, this is such an intense jungle, what's going on here. The vitality here, you know, it's working through. It's palpable. It's palpable. It's like yeah. it's probably five times faster of growth than what we'd have in Ontario, Canada. Sure. But when I'm in Ontario, Canada, because things are slowed down a little bit, I can see a thousand years into the future mm. because I've been there 20 years. So I've seen like what happens to the forest over 20 years. So then I can kind of get a feel for, Hey, what would happen over a hundred years in this spot? Yeah. You just five exit. Yeah. And then you go, well, maybe what would happen over a thousand years in this spot. And so there's that idea of like, Hey, we're creating soil for the future. We're creating a, a, a reservoir of trees here for the future. We're creating a reservoir of interesting woods for the future that might be needed for a bow and arrow or a staff or building material or something, something Did like this. Did you hear this. the thunder just go off? Yeah, that was great. That was incredible. <laughs> awesome. I, so so that's kind of how it is. It's, it's we're building for the future. OK, I really appreciate that. So thank you for uh, this uh, beautiful enlightenment and expanding on your childlike energy and the imagination codes that you picked up while holding such wisdom. It's truly something to behold. And I'm stoked that everyone are going to get to hear this. Thanks so much, bro. Appreciate it. Big love.